the way it's being treated. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I call Michael Warden. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm delighted to rise in support of the bill and the supplementary order paper. And I want to thank the previous speaker, the Honourable uh, Stephen Joyce, um, for his detailed exploration of the 197 pages of detail that emerged from the Select Committee on this important tax bill that covered a wide, wide range of areas. But actually, of course, he spoke about the three-page supplementary order paper. I understand it's been a long, long and difficult day for the National Party, and I want to fill in a few of the gaps, um, a few of the things that he missed in his comments about this piece of legislation that's been in the works for about nine months and in which the Select Committee across the House has engaged very constructively. But before I do that, I think I would be remiss if I didn't provide a little bit of additional commentary on the supplementary order paper that we do have before us here today, sir. And what I want to start with um, is an example that was provided by CoreLogic, um, the public policy organisation who's done a lot of work about the housing crisis and probably understands the state of the New Zealand housing market more than most other organisations who are out there. And here's an example that they raised in recent public debate about the Bright Line test. And as it happens, it relates to my own beautiful electorate of Mount Roskill, oh, where a property on Rauranga Avenue sold for $1.95 million on the 30th of August 2016. It was then settled in November. In June of the next year, it was flipped for $2.8 million. In nine months, a huge big capital gain of $836,000. And Mr Speaker, the changes that this government is going to implement in the housing market, inclusive of this capital gains tax, is about moving towards a fairer and more reasonable regime that says to New Zealanders, yes, we're going to treat you fairly. If you go out there and you work hard in your job, you get paid your salary, you get taxed on it. You have a whole range of other investments, you get taxed on it. But in cases like this one, people who are making huge capital gains are not necessarily being taxed on them. And that absolutely is one of the factors that is contributing to a property market that is absolutely out of control. And every single member of this House, if they care to ask around, will find people in the areas that they represent who have simply been driven out of the property market. And I've got to reflect on Mr Joyce's comments and his passionate plea for more time to look at this issue. Well, after nine years of utter inaction in the housing crisis, nine years in which hundreds of thousands of people have been driven away from the dream of home ownership, nine years in which home ownership rates have slipped to their lowest level since the early 1950s, when Sydney Holland was the Prime Minister in this House, this Labour-led government says we're not going to sit on our hands anymore, we're actually going to do something. And we are going to implement those commitments that we made at the time of the election when people said, we want a new government that will actually take action on the housing crisis. And what do we hear from Mr Joyce? We had him deferring to the government departments. Well, of course we take advice, of course we, take, uh, we listen to our government departments and consider what they have to say. But leadership in government, sir, means knowing what your policy is, means knowing what the problems are, and means marching towards some solutions with some determination. It doesn't mean you always simply say, yes, sir, yes, madam, we're going to listen to what the Treasury or the IRD say. We'll listen to what they say, but this government will actually take action on the issues. And one of the reasons that we have properties like Rauranga Avenue uh, with a capital gain of $800,000 over nine months is because for nine years that previous government did absolutely nothing about this issue. So I have to say, sir, that I'm absolutely in support of the supplementary order paper. And I've got to also mention you know, that this, this sort of emotive point that Mr Joyce came back to, that somehow this is going to impact um, your honest, sort of hard-working uh, mum and dad investor looking for a nest egg. Well, those kind of investors aren't flipping properties within five years, Mr Speaker. Those kind of investors are setting up a long-term investment for their retirement. And it is simply scaremongering, it is simply inaccurate to say that a five-year five bright line test, which is aimed at, at, at cracking down on those speculators, is going to have any impact on those long-term investors. That is simply not the nature of it. And let's just also respond to the high dudgeon that we hear on the other side of the House. Because what that previous government did um, after the last election, when they were forced into doing something to look like they um, had any solution to the housing crisis, is pretty quickly they introduced the Bright Line test. 
It was a two-year bright line test. But let's be realistic about this. There's no great point of principle here. We're talking about making it a longer bright line test to make it more effective. That is what we are talking about, and that is what this government... That's right. Well, you keep backing the officials. You keep pretending, Mr Hudson, that there is nothing wrong. And what I would say to the new National Party opposition, with their new leadership, is that if they keep putting their heads in the sand and saying there is absolutely nothing wrong with the housing market, if that opposition continues pretending that all is fine and dandy with the housing market, with the lowest rates of home ownership since the 1950s after nine years of their watch, then please go ahead. Because New Zealanders know that there is something wrong, this government don't knows that there is something wrong, and we are quite happy to be the ones who do something about the matter, sir. Mr Speaker, Having dealt with that little issue, I want to return to some of the other um, aspects uh, that come through in the, in the um, Bar 2 version of the bill that has been reported back from Select Committee. And notwithstanding my previous comments, I actually do want to pay tribute to members of the House um, from all different parties um, who are part of the Finance and Expenditure Select Committee, who worked through what is, was a pretty complex piece of uh, legislation and I think have come to a really good outcome. I want to acknowledge uh, the former minister, uh, Judith Collins, who's in the House, who put the bill before the select committee prior to the last election, and the current minister, Stuart Nash, who's shown a willingness to engage um, around the issues and come back with an improved piece of legislation. Um, the uh, bill that is before us does a few key things. One is that it confirms the tax, rate, tax rates for um, the current tax year. That is, of course, rather important. We want to make sure that the appropriation, uh, the money that we appropriate from the good residents of New Zealand is done so lawfully. Um, but it also has a number of measures with, within it which modernise and improve the tax system. And these, um, to a large extent, relate to the business transformation project. Um, quite a lot of changes relating to payday, uh, um, uh, the frequency of uh, reporting, uh, moving to a payday reporting system, and investment income reporting. And the benefit of these changes is that they allow in, in, um, inland revenue and the broader apparatus of government uh, to have better and more timely information. And in doing so, we, can, we are more likely to ensure that we are actually taxing individuals at the correct amount. So while there are potentially some small burdens that fall on those who have to file in terms of more regular filing, and I'll address some of the changes made at Select Committee here, um, the benefits for um, taxpayers across the board are actually quite significant in my view here. The third key purpose of the bill at the outset was improving the settings to ensure that we retain that broad-based low-rate tax system that has pretty wide support um, in the New Zealand tax community and in this parliament. And you do that by making sure that you're taxing fairly across um, all areas of economic activity. And the key one that this uh, bill looked to address um, was the area of employment share schemes, where after quite a lot of dialogue over a number of years, um, Inland Revenue, the past government and this government, has arrived at the conclusion that we do need some um, improvements to ensure that um, in, in, um, uh, earnings that are received as a result of employee share schemes are effectively taxed in more or less the same way as earnings that people receive in other ways. And there was a concern that our previous regime uh, didn't achieve that. In the time I have left, Mr Speaker, I just want to touch on one or two of the key changes that the Select Committee uh, made. And one of the ones that I really want to focus on, which I think was a good change, which we got agreement on um, across the committee, um, re re uh, is about the uh, the what's called the payroll subsidy. And this is a small amount which is paid to ensure that largely small employers um, have the ability, have a bit of support, um, to go through a payroll intermediary to make sure that their tax is being filed electronically and in the right way. And this is quite a useful innovation that was introduced a number of years ago, and it gives those quite small employers mainly just a little bit of extra support uh, to make sure that they're paying their tax in the right way. Now, the original proposal of the bill was to do away with that payroll subsidy. And in the view of the committee, sir, that was a bit hard line, a bit arbitrary, a bit ideological. Um, and in our view, it is entirely appropriate, particularly when this bill puts a number of, other, number of new obligations in terms of the frequency of filing on employers, to provide just a little bit of support uh, to those small employers. So the payroll subsidy has been reformed under the uh, bill that has emerged from Select Committee. We're keeping it in place for two more years to allow people to transition into the new requirements. 
and it will now be more targeted. So it will just apply to those employers um, who file with f um, under $50,000 of tax each year. But those employers, as a result of the Select Committee's work, will still have access to that payroll subsidy. And I think that was a very good change indeed. So overall, Mr Speaker, this is an important bill. Um, it modernises our, our tax system. Uh, I commend it to the House, along with a supplementary order paper, which will bring back a little bit of fairness to our property market. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker. I call the Honourable Judith Collins. Oh, thank you, Mr Speaker. It's been a delight to listen to the discussion this afternoon.